Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Dr. Francesca Ortegren about employee stress and burnout among remote employees. Francesca Ortegren, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. I'm super excited to have this conversation. And earlier uh, in the week when uh, I I can't remember who it was at your organization who reached out to me um, uh, talking about some of the research that that you're up that you're working on. And uh, it's really timely and very important. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to explore with you today employee stress and burnout among remote employees and what organizational leaders and organizations can do um, to better take care of their employees and to to manage this kind of a situation and hopefully not only protect the physical health of our employees, but the mental health as well and uh, have thriving and and, uh, productive and dynamic teams even in a remote kind of a work environment. So that'll be the focus of our conversation today. As we get started, I wanted to share Francesca's bio with everybody. Dr. Francesca Ortegren is the data science and research product manager at Clever Real Estate, the the nation's leading real estate education platform for home buyers, sellers, and investors. A widely cited expert on real estate, personal finance, and the economy, Dr. Ortegren began her career as a professor and researcher at the University of Southern Indiana with a focus on research methods and statistics. At Clever, Dr. Ortegren directs Clever's data center, Uh, compiling original data and conducting studies that have been published on major publications, including Yahoo Finance, CNBC, Business Insider, Forbes, and more. When she's not researching the real estate industry, Francesca can be found outdoors hiking, biking, running, kayaking with her two cute dogs, or possibly pursuing another certification in research, software engineering, or data science. Uh, A woman after my own heart. It sounds like uh, we have many similarities in our, our interests, background, and passions, including the two dogs and the love for the outdoors. Um, what breed of dogs do you have? Um, I have a chocolate lab. He is getting pretty old now. He's about 13. Um, and then I have a boxer mutt mix. Um, and he's about 10. He's actually sitting oh, right yeah. behind me. There, there he is. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. I have a Brittany and I have a Cavachon. Um, kind of a medium-sized dog and a little small dog and yeah you know, they're best of friends and we love going out on hikes and exploring the the surroundings here so yeah fine well wonderful and yeah. uh your your academic background and your research background um i am i'm also a professor uh, in addition to doing the consulting work that i do um, i teach um business HR organizational development change management um, with with an extensive background in, in data analysis statistics and data analytics and uh, sounds like we we share a lot of interest in that regard and uh, I'm really super curious and interested in learning more about how you made that transition um, uh, into your current uh, work environment and then perhaps we can dive into some of the findings of your recent study around virtual, work and burnout and such. Yeah, um, it actually fits kind of well. Um, I was teaching for a few years and, and doing research at university and um, some things with my, my partners also in academia. So finding two jobs in the same location in academia is notoriously difficult. Um, but kind of while we were trying to find jobs in the same place, I realized, you know, teaching just wasn't for me. I was already starting to get burnt out actually after Um, I think, gosh, four years. Um, So I started looking for just something else, maybe 
with teaching on the side and, and doing something else part-time. And um, I started taking like programming classes. Um, I had a little bit of coding experience with um, the experiments that I did in grad school. I actually coded those myself um, in a language that's not very widely used, but um, it gave me kind of a, uh, a nudge. I, I enjoyed doing that more than I enjoyed doing most other things that I had to do during grad school. So um, I think that was a sign that maybe uh, I should have just pursued that in the first place. But um, yeah, so I did that. And then I, I uh, my boss found me on LinkedIn um, when I was kind of at a point where I was going to take about a six month break and try to figure out what I wanted to do. And it just kind of fit. It was, uh, he wanted me to do these research studies it was very kind of in line with what I liked about academia um, and without the things that I didn't love. Um, so I've kind of, I've been here for about a year and a half now and it's been um, kind of a lot of different hats. So I still do the research, but I also work with our engineering team. So I get a little bit of both of the sides that I enjoy. Yeah, well, that's that's really interesting. Thank you for sharing and indulging sure. me a little bit to hear about <laughs> yeah. that, that journey. Um, and, my wife and I are actually kind of in a similar situation currently. She's finishing up her doctorate mm -hmm. and uh, finding to uh, trying to find dual career opportunities um, in academia can be challenging. So that's that's currently where we're at, and we'll we'll see where that lands us. But, um, anyways, let's let's dig into some of your current research and uh, what you're finding about burnout and dealing with stress and anxiety among these virtual workers. As we know, of course, uh, amidst COVID, so many organizations had to, you know, flip the switch and almost overnight move to a virtual workforce, or at least largely so. And you're, there are a lot of growing pains around that. Um, and, you know, some organizations handled the transition better than others, but I think everyone has struggled long term with just how do we better lead and manage people when they're virtual and not together in a physical space? How do we maintain culture? How do we have a positive team dynamic uh, when people aren't ever together? Uh, and some of those types of things. And then you have on the on the other side of it, the social isolation issues uh, of people being, you know, remote constantly, never getting connected. Um, you know, my family, we have six children. So my wife and I are both working from home. We're schooling six children from home um, and all the stress and anxiety around that. Um, and then you layer on top of that, like social unrest and Black Lives Matter and like political upheaval. And you like, it was, it was a, it's been a really, really rough year. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I like to, I like to focus on resilience and, um, you know, what we can learn from these challenges, but the bottom line is it's been, it's been tough and it's taken its toll on people. Um, so what, what do you know from your recent research about what that toll has been? And then we can explore how we can uh, deal with it and, and tackle it. Yeah, it's definitely been a lot. Um, so there's a little bit of stress that goes along with working from home anyway. Uh, some of the things that you mentioned, like not being connected with the team, especially if your team is mostly not remote and you're remote, you're kind of disconnected even more. Um, so on top of those regular stressors that we experience, we have a pandemic and all of this other stuff kind of piled on top of that. Um, so we were interested in seeing kind of how people were dealing with it um, in their jobs and kind of everyday lives, how it was affecting their mental health. Um, and we did find that almost half of people said that they were feeling burnt out. Um, I think it was 41 percent um, and about 87 percent of employees said that their job is currently impacting their mental health, um, which is kind of staggering. That was a little bit higher than we anticipated. Um, but there's a lot going on there, right? A lot of us are working from, you know, our bedrooms or our living rooms. So that connection between life and, and job is just so strong right now because it's all in the same place. Um, and then now we have like, like you, for example, have kids at home while you're trying to work, it's harder to kind of separate those two spaces. Um, so I can, I can see why work would be more impactful on, on mental health right now than it would be normally. Um, Unfortunately, though, we are seeing that people just don't take time off. They're not doing the things that they need to do to kind of mitigate these feelings. Um, and can I can I speak to that for just a moment? Like, yeah. And that that has been, you know, anecdotally my experience. It's it's hard 
it's harder perhaps to to kind of set up those boundaries when everything is just meshed together right you said you know many people are working in their bedrooms that's i'm in the corner of my bedroom at the moment <laughs> <laughs> um you're it looks like you're in your bedroom at the moment like yeah. so so we're, we're doing the best we can with the physical space that we have mm -hmm. and everything just bleeds together and there's a lot of benefit to that in terms of the flexibility so if i need to step away for an hour to do whatever with my kids or to you know whatever i can do that the question is am i keeping like the appropriate boundaries mm -hmm. between, you know, my work and my personal life. And what I found personally is that I've worked probably way too much this past year, um, more than I ever would have otherwise, just because I'm here and like, I, it's just so easy and I don't have a commute and like all of these things end up combining forces uh, to the efficiencies of remote work. And like, I don't have to like walk across campus to go to a meeting. Like I just hop on a, a team's meeting mm -hmm. and, and all of that means it's more efficient, but it means I'm also doing more. And, and, mm -hmm. uh, I'm just, if, if I'm not careful, I'm not, not practicing self-care and making sure I'm getting out and exercising and sleeping and eating right, you know, pretty soon, um, you know, it, it really is going to take that toll. So I, I don't know, I, I, I resonate with those statistics you're sharing. And I hope, I hope that people can um, practice, you know, some of the things that are necessary in order for them to maintain uh, the, the emotional and physical health that is so important. Absolutely. I think those boundaries are really important. There's been um, other research more recently that you should kind of build in a like faux commute before and after work where you have some dedicated thing that you're doing for say 30 minutes before you sit down for work and then 30 minutes after it doesn't have to be the same thing but maybe you go on a walk or read a book um something that's not work related and not necessarily like jumping into doing the dishes or laundry at home so it gives you that sense of like getting ready for work versus you know kind of i'm going home and i'm not going to deal with work um, I think that's a really good way to just separate the day a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's really easy to roll out of bed and walk 10 feet and start your work day and then go back to work, you know, after dinner, because your computer is your office now. So, um, so those boundaries are really important. We found that the, I guess the lack of boundaries is, can really contribute to feelings of burnout, burnout because people feel like they have more work to do, like it never ends. Um, and people reported not being able to um, like turn that off and not be able to decompress after work, um, which is a problem we have as Americans anyway. We're kind of, we have this culture of like being hustling all the time. You know, the grind is, is really important, um, but that seems to be more so now where people have, are having a hard time like shutting down after work because there's no like clear boundary between work and home. Yeah. W one thing that I started doing, I mean, I've always walked my dogs and I, and I, as we were talking about earlier, you know, I, I, I like to hike and, and to get out there. We live like within 15 minutes of the mountains and, and 10 minutes of the lake. And, you know, there's lots of beauty around us to get out and, and mm -hmm. we live right next to a park. So at the minimum, I can just, you know, walk out my backyard and there's a park. Um, and so I've always walked my dogs. I'm very religious about doing that. I'm very consistent. But one of the things I decided to start in January was really to, to your point about this artificial commute. Uh, I would usually walk them in the evenings. And now I make sure that I walk them first thing in the morning. Um, you know, I take 30 minutes right in the, the beginning of the day, uh, go out, walk the dog. Sometimes we go up to the mountains and, and, and do that. Sometimes we go to the lake. Sometimes we just go to the park. Um, but, we, but we have that time and it allows me to kind of warm up my brain and, and get started. Um, also get some physical activity. It's good for the dogs. Uh, and then I do that later in the evening as well. And it does, I found provide a nice set of bookends, you know, to my day and a little bit more structure. And I'm a little bit more ready to either engage with work after the morning walk or disengage from work at the end of the day and not feel drawn to it. Right. Because I, I have that kind of buffer built in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's really important. I'm excited to announce 
the publication of my new book from HCI Press, The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership, Ordinary Everyday Actions That Produce Extraordinary Results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. The bookend you were mentioning, so that this is the start of my day and this is the end of my day, that's really important. Um, we did find too that people have reported working earlier, staying later, working on the weekends, non-work hours, which I, I don't have kids, so I don't have that extra stressor here, but I can imagine if you have kids who are at home for the last year, have been at home for the last year, it's a lot harder to keep traditional work hours than if you're, you get to drop them off at school or, or uh, daycare and go to an actual office where you have like dedicated time and space for work. Um, so I'm sure that's something that's contributing to it as well. Um, these kind of non-traditional work hours that people are putting in. Um, yeah. And, and, and something else that has always been a problem in, in Western culture and, and particularly in, in America, we just don't, we're not very good about like taking time off. Uh, you mentioned this a moment ago, um, but like more, more formally in terms of like vacation time. So mm -hmm. we, I'm not sure, I haven't looked recently, but we're at least among the worst in the world for the amount of paid time off that we provide employees. Mm -hmm. We might even be the worst. Like we're, we're really in bad shape in terms of, of how much um, time off we give to employees. But what's even worse than that is most employees don't take what they, they're given. Right. Um, and so you, you add on top of that kind of already existing culture a pandemic environment, people are working from home. It's just so easy to kind of get sucked back into your work at any, you know, any given point in time. And then you can't go anywhere for vacation. And so like, why do you want to take vacation if you can't do anything? Uh, and so it seems like even fewer people are using up their vacation days. They're not taking the needed breaks and rest time. Um, the, the opportunity to kind of recalibrate, you know, just step away, um, the, the, it's so important. And frankly, most other parts of the world and other cultures seem to be better at it than us anyways. <laughs> I'm wondering what you found in your research uh, related to that. Yeah, we found just that people, even when they do have PTO, um, they don't use it all. Um, only about 35% of the workers that we um, surveyed said that they attempt to use all of their vacation days or that they were going to in 2020. Um, and so that's a big chunk of people who aren't even trying to use all their vacation days. And like you said, we don't have great PTO policies across the United States. So it's, it's not that they have way too many days to take off. Um, it's just that they're leaving days upon days unused. Uh, we found the average worker was leaving about seven days unused by the end of the year um, of PTO. And that could be partly because of the things that you were saying, we don't have anywhere to go. We couldn't travel for the majority of 2020. Um, and that is part of it, but we saw these trends prior to the pandemic as well. Um, so it is, I think, a, a culture that we have around work that missing work is, is seen as maybe like not caring about your job or um, people tend to be worried about missing out on opportunities for like raises, promotions, because they'll look like they don't care as much if they take vacation time. Um, and some other people feel, felt guilty about missing work. Um, we found that uh, about 23% of people report feeling guilty when they take time off, which is, I think, a bad sign for mental health in general. Um, and it, it makes you question kind of the culture at, at most em employers uh, or that most employers 
uh, create in their workplaces. Um, I know at Clever, we're encouraged to take time off, whether it's because we're tired that day or feeling sick or need mental health time. Um, so I'm really grateful for that, but I don't think that that's the norm. Um, and it doesn't seem that that's the norm from what people say. A lot of people are worried either that their peers or that their management is going to look look at them poorly because they took time off. Yeah, yeah. So with the stress, the anxiety, the burnout, uh, people not using up their existing uh, PTO, what what's the answer to this? Like, how, <laughs> if I'm an organizational leader, I'm I'm listening to this episode and I'm hearing these statistics. It should be alarming. So what what can we do as leaders to help um, our people better cope with this moment that we're in? Uh, to 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 better deal with things and and reduce the amount of burnout, reduce the amount of anxiety and stress and mental health challenges. Um, what did you find in some of your research and or what are, are some of the things that you would suggest? Yeah, um, a lot of it has to do with, when, when it comes to remote work, a lot of it has to do with the connections people feel and the pressure that they feel to perform. So um, burnout can is more likely when people feel like they're being micromanaged or kind of um, overly observed, which can happen like if you have that computer software where you can kind of see every click that your employees do, they might feel like they have to be on all the time. And that's just stressful thinking that someone's watching you all the time. Um, that's one of the biggest uh, predictors of burnout, along with just too much work to do, um, a lack of communication with managers or bad relationships with management. Um, so I think encouraging managers to, to be open to feedback, upward feedback, um, and keep those lines of communication open, really important. Um, one thing I know is a, a really big predictor as well is not being sure of what is expected of you, whether that's, you know, when should I be logged into Slack or can I take a lunch break? Do I have to work an extra hour at the end of the day if I take an hour lunch break, you know, um, or, you know, are these due dates set in stone? It, anything about expectations, if those are more clear, people feel more comfortable in their space and doing their work um, with unclear expectations, especially when time pressure is added to that, that makes people feel um, really stressed about what they're doing and decreases productivity. It has all these negative effects, including burnout. Um, so being really clear about expectations is gonna be important at the management level. Um, in terms of like PTO, I think that there are things that companies can do and leadership can do to really encourage people to feel like they should take their PTO, not that it's just there in case you absolutely need it. Um, and one thing that leaders can do is take time off themselves, you know, just lead by example. Um, if you are, whether you're, you know, the CEO of a company or your middle management, um, I think taking that time for yourself and not creating this culture of I always have to work there, therefore you always have to work kind of idea um, is going to be really important. Um, and keeping paid time off a little bit more general. So it you don't have to tell your boss why you're taking time off because a lot of people don't want to open up and say I'm not feeling well or my kids are taking time from my day or, or I'm having a mental health crisis and I need some time. Um, so just being able to say, hey, I'm not going to be able to come in on Tuesday that should be enough, you know? Um, so I think those things we can encourage people to be more open to taking pay time off um, and maybe incentivize yeah. people to do it too. I mean, I guess even if it's there, people aren't doing it. So um, that, that one I think is gonna be a little, it's a little more difficult to get people to do something like that. Um, yeah, that, that, sure. that requires some culture shift. And, and I think it does come back to like you were saying, it it's not enough to just, make it available. And it's not enough to even say you should take your paid time off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it really does have, if, if I am an employee and I have these, these days, these hours, uh, and my boss is even telling me, make sure you take your days, but then my boss never goes on vacation, never takes time off. Or when they're on vacation, they're still like calling and emailing people, Yeah, you know, or when you go on vacation, they are calling and emailing you. It, it, it doesn't fit. Right. And so you have to f walk the walk and not just talk the talk And that. Mm -hmm. That example is going to matter more than you may know. Uh, and so it's, it's essential that leaders 
provide that example. Uh, it's it's obviously important to, to have it in place uh, so that people can do it. And there's a reason why we call it paid time off now. Um, you know, when I, I, I teach HR, I've been researching in this space. When I was going through grad school, uh, PTO, the terminology was just kind of beginning and people were still talking about vacation days versus sick days and all that kind of stuff. And to your point, that is just discouraging people to take time off that they need if they have to justify it. Right. <laughs> uh, and they have to, you know, and, and I, I remember as a teenager um, needing to, I had a, I needed to take a day off and I couldn't, like, they couldn't get it to me. And so I just had to call in sick, even though I wasn't sick for something that was really important. Now that was a dumb teenager job, but you know, the, those types of experiences come up where we just have an, a family emergency. We need to deal with it. It's nobody's business what that emergency is, but right. we still need to deal with it. And we have the time. So let, let's just let us use it. Um, and that, I think that there's been a really good shift in that direction over the last decade or so. Um, mm -hmm. But there's still holdovers, uh, you know, to kind of the older mentality. And I think it's, it's high time that we just get past that. Um, you know, I think there are so many things we can explore around this. Um, I do want to be sensitive to your time. Uh, I know you you have uh, other things you need to get off to and do. But before we close for today, I did want to give you a chance to share with listeners um, how they can get connected with you, how they can find out more about um, your organization and the type of work and research that you're doing. And then just give us the final word on the topic for today. Sure. Um, you can get a hold of me on Twitter. It's at Dr. Fran with three ends at the end, um, <laughs> a few extra ends. Um, or on LinkedIn, I'm probably the only Francesca Ortegren um, in the world. So I am definitely the only one on LinkedIn, I'm pretty sure. Um, so you can find me either of those places or on our website, um, which is listwithclever.com. Uh, we are a real estate company. We um, connect people with really great real estate agents all over the country um, at a lower commission cost. So you don't have to spend as much um, to buy or sell a home as you normally would. Um, so um, you can find us, like I said, listwithclever.com slash research is where you can find all of our research. We do um, kind of a wide variety of topics, um, mostly focused around personal finance, um, some real estate. And um, now that we're all kind of in this new remote workspace, we, we kind of dove into that a little bit in terms of looking at um, how office workers versus remote workers are dealing with this, this time, both in terms of mental health and, and what they like about it, things like that. So um, you can find kind of non-financial interesting research there as well. Um, and I guess the big takeaway here is for managers, just pay attention to your culture, make sure you're being supportive um, and taking your own mental health into consideration. Don't overwork yourself or your employees are gonna do the same. Um, and for people working at home, I think if you can, you know, if you don't have six kids running around, it's probably a little bit easier, but um, try to set those boundaries for work time. And I think that that'll help um, like create a space for home and work um, and hopefully mitigate some of that um, that stress that comes from working at home during uh, pandemic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Francesca. It's been a real pleasure talking with you today. I appreciate your insights, sharing your, your research with us. And I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Francesca can do for you and some of the research that, that she's engaged in. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. We are excited about the launch of HCI's new magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free, interactive e-magazine designed to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We will be publishing issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Check out the first issue and let us know what you think.
Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.